I'll just say to the whole community that, uh, yes, something happened today as in a milestone was achieved and um, it, it didn't just happen. It took a lot of work, a lot of uh, dedication and um, uh, efficiency on the part, especially of uh, Elena and Manoi, who, who's here, uh, who are the trustees I've been working really closely with to to uh, make steps towards securing our property. And we managed to do go through the contract. We've niggled over all sorts of little things, not in a bad way, but, you know, we've organised which furniture they'll take, which furniture they'll leave. We went to see the owners in the house and discussed all that over sparkly, non-alcoholic water. <laughs> and, um, and then we put it all in the contracts and we've had the lawyers exchange and check everything out and... Today, Manori and Tamali, another trustee, went into London, Enfield actually, uh, to take out the deposit money, 10%, and uh, send it to our lawyer. It's in the account, it's in his account. And now the signature of her and Ali, and they simply just have to write to the lawyer and say, we give our approval. Um, on Monday, the 6th of February, it will be legally binding. So mm -hmm. it'd be very hard to stop it at this point. You might think, well, still two more days, but it's the end of Friday. Mm -hmm. Everything's been said yes. Mm -hmm. And Monday morning, as soon as he's ready, he'll just uh, give the money over to the to the uh, <laughs> to the sellers. <laughs> so uh, there's no going back. <laughs> and our moving date is the 22nd yeah. of March, even though the agent is now saying, can you make it a bit later? Because I'm sure it'll take them a long time. And no, <laughs> frankly, because I'm coming with people who are already booked into the monastery. So um, that is the news. And it's rather auspicious that um, everything's just fallen together amazingly. Because Alina was actually planning to stay with me at this time anyway. But it just so happened she was here while we were doing this for the last three days. So we've just been you know, engaged constantly from late mo early morning till late at night and it just so happens that today's sutta discussion is on establishing an equitable society so it all feels very nice because that's exactly what we're about to do and hopefully the extra space is going to make it extra inclusive and extra inviting for all kinds of people and I think that's what equity really means isn't it it means equal and it means that people have fair and equal opportunities, you know, no matter what their religion, gender, race. And so far, there isn't such equity in the Sangha in the UK, very sadly. You know, if you want to ordain as a novice, fine. But you have to stay a novice. And you're told that very clearly. That's uh, non-disputable, non-discussable. And that's very, very sad. So now there is actually going to be more have the chance to develop this equitable society and here we have the beautiful buddhist teachings to guide us as to how mm. so um i'm pretty tired so i'm going to try and take a backward seat today but i will read mm. the first bit because it just follows on from what i was saying then venerable peko will start the sutta proper and for those who are new to this uh group it's not a lecture it is a discussion. So she'll mm. pause from time to time and we'll both mm. maybe mm. offer some reflections if they uh, feel fitting mm. as we read. And uh, you can ask questions either audibly by raising your virtual hand or you can chat in the box at any time or we'll read out your comment. So it's lovely to hear from all of you. That really is what brings it alive because it's just remarkable how these Buddhist teachings are as applicable, if not even more applicable in terms of their need today in our societies now. And that's why when the Buddha taught, his teachings were known as akaliko, timeless and relevant. And um, everything he said then applies to society now. Maybe slightly different descriptions and examples that he uses, but we'll see how we can apply it to ourselves. Yes. Shall I? Yeah. So we're on the last chapter. It's page 165. In this last part of the anthology, sorry, in the last part of this anthology, we move from the intentional community 
to the natural community, proceeding from the family to the larger society and then to the state. The texts included here reveal the pragmatic astuteness of the Buddha's wisdom, his ability to address practical issues with uncanny insight and directness. Although he had adopted the life of a samana, a renunciant who stood outside all social institutions, from the distance he looked back into the social institutions of his time and suggested ideals and arrangements to promote the spiritual, psychological and physical well-being of people still immersed in the confines of the world. He apparently saw that the key to a healthy society lies the fulfilment of one's responsibilities towards others. There's an answer about responsibility right there. He regarded the social order as a tapestry of overlapping and intersecting relationships, each of which imposed on people duties with respect to those at the other pole of each relationship in which they participated. This point comes through most saliently in the first text, and that's what we'll read today, the Sigala, is it Sigalo Vada? Yeah, yeah Sigala. Sigalaka Avada, yeah? An excerpt from a discourse given to a young man named Sigalaka. The Buddha here treats society as constituted by six paired relationships. Okay, so there's six types. Number one, parents and children. Number two, husbands and wives. That I think should be adapted to say partners of any gender. Friends with each other, number three. Number four, employers and employees. Number five, teachers and students. And number six, religious teachers and lay supporters. So this is one that's often not included, isn't it, in modern society, I suppose. For each, the Buddha proposed five, or in one case, six duties that each should fulfill towards the others. He sees that every, that the individual, every individual, as standing at a point where the six directions converge and thus obliged to honour these directions by performing the duties inherent in relationship. Mm. Okay, I'm going to stop there so that we can get into the sutta itself. And that will make more sense once we start to read the sutta. So um, is there anything already from anybody there? Because that's already quite rich. And you can again type it in or stick up the hand and we can pause. Otherwise, we'll get straight in. Okay, so this is 171. Right, so here we go. The Buddha is speaking to a young man named Sigala. And how, young man, does the noble disciple protect the six directions? These six things are to be regarded as the six directions. Let me stop here. But the six directions would is, is probably what would have been happening is that this young man would have been doing his um, ritual of worshipping the six directions, which yeah. would have been a practice at that time in India not knowing the reason and just kind of blindly following this ritual that has uh, his parents would have taught him, his great grandparents would have been doing anyway. So there's oh sorry. Only man? Well okay. <laughs> Only man? I don't well, who, whoever, yes. Anyway, so um he the Buddha as I'm I'm sure you know, he often took uh, practices that were or even ideas that were um, popular in the time of the uh, in his time, and reframed them so that they were no longer just a blind ritual or um, a, just something that is just believed for itself. And so this is a just a beautiful example of where he has taken um, a popular practice and given it meaning, a different meaning, a different meaning. Yeah, a different meaning. So that's what the six directions would have been. This man would have been doing his early morning prostrations in the six directions. Mm 
You mean geographical directions? Yeah, geographical directions. So the six directions. The east denotes mother and father. The south denotes teachers. The west denotes wife, wife and children. The north denotes friends and companions. The nadir, is it up? nadir denotes servants. Oh, down, down. Oh, it's servants, workers, and helpers. The zenith denotes ascetics and brahmins. These are all the different relationships that one could have in that time and probably even today, really. There are five ways in which a son should minister, son or daughter should minister to his mother and father as the eastern direction. So how do you, how do we, um, how does the Buddha say that uh, child should um uh how he how a child should uh, relate to his parents he should think having been supported by them i will support them i will perform their duties for them i will keep up the family tradition. I will be worthy of my heritage. After my parents' death, I will distribute gifts on their behalf. And there are five ways. Yes. So stop yeah, there. Do, that, do, that, do, do, that. do, do yeah. the whole thing. I think so. And there are five ways in which parents, so ministered by their child as the eastern direction, will reciprocate. They will restrain him from e or her from evil, support him or her in doing good, teach him or her some skill. Find him or her a suitable wife. And in due time, hand over their inheritance to, to him or her. In this way, the eastern direction is covered, making it secure and free from peril. Mm. So, family relationships. Yeah. <laughs> Does everyone, yeah. anyone have a, a family relationship that is free from peril, covered and secure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll stop here. And yeah. uh, see if there's, there's a. a um, there's a. A lot here, because all of us have relation, good and bad relationships with our parents. Sometimes both, <laughs> <laughs> on different days or the same day. <laughs> and with and our parents to us and to our children. So this is what the Buddha says. He should, anyway, he should support them. He would keep up the, he would perform their duties. Keep up the family tradition. Yeah. All th Is it relevant? Would anyone like to comment or describe their family relationships? You're all very quiet. Amazing. I'm sure you'll warm up soon. <laughs> Here we go. We can't apply it. I'll do the unmuting. It's easy that way. I was just going to share that I, uh, living with and caring for my elderly parents right mm -hmm. now. This is definitely helpful uh, to hear. I, I'm not sure what the 
those family duties might refer to mm -hmm. um, possibly like paying bills and um, <clears throat> correspondence and neighborhood neighbor neighbor relationships possibly mm. yeah it's interesting to um I was also thinking about like that that sort of doing their duties for them perhaps particularly refers mm. to when they're too frail or unable to do them for themselves anymore mm -hmm. and in a sense keeping their um life mm. in good order isn't it like yeah. keeping all the practical side ticking over and making mm. sure say their finances are protected and I have a mm. friend in Perth who had to go back to uh, Sydney because his mom's getting older she has dementia and she's um literally smoking all her savings away mm. so that she will be without a home in a few years if she carries on I didn't know if cigarettes were that expensive, but she's smoking mm. like a hundred a day and she has no idea what she's doing. So he's gone over to become, to get power mm. of attorney on the accounts. Mm. Um, and he's, he has to be there indefinitely. He was actually at, um, anyway, I won't say exactly where he was, but it was a big lifestyle change, put it that, that way. Um, mm. But he says there is, really isn't a choice and other people in his family, although they're local, they aren't going to do it. And you can just see that for him, it's part of his practice. You know, it's an important thing that he feels he has to do for the sake of his conscience and doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we might not be in a position yeah. to leave our jobs or leave our, our families to look after our parents yeah. because you might have, you know, your yeah. own family yeah. and your yeah. parents might be living in another country far, far mm -hmm. away. So. Yeah that becomes kind of painful. It might be, but then if you are able to, rejoicing in that opportunity and not yeah. judging yourself if you can't, right? I mean, it would be painful, but yeah. I, I'm sure there's things you can still do. Yeah. Because part of the duty yeah. would also be emotional support, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. And just checking in. And, yeah. it, it, it's not quite the same on Zoom as it is on... It's not the same. <laughs> But it's certainly better than it used to be if you are on the other side. Yes. Yeah. Okay, shall we see? Yeah. If the family tradition is bad, such as thieving, surely one should not have all these traditions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Chelsea and says, uh, oh, and what? Oh, it's is another one. Sorry, I thought it was also Shirley. No, good point, Maybe Shirley. But point Shirley's point first yes <laughs> so yeah yeah that would be a bit difficult if your family is but I don't I think um you'd use your discernment there and mm -hmm. uh, and the question then would be like be... to bring the two your parents on a good yeah. path because the Buddha said that you know one of the um mm -hmm. most wonderful things in fact the most wonderful way to pay back our parents the only way other than carrying them on your shoulder, literally, for I don't know how far, mm -hmm. is to teach them the Dhamma. But I love that analogy of carrying them on your shoulder, because mm -hmm. whether it actually means literally or not, yeah, that okay. is heavy, right? Mm -hmm. That is challenging, as Kilaya mm -hmm. said. It's, sorry, Kilaya. Kilaya, Kilaya. Mm -hmm. It's challenging, and mm -hmm. yet the Buddha's praising it. He's mm -hmm. saying you do everything you possibly can, because without your parents, you wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think uh, you know the other the the only way you can really start to repay the debt of gratitude for having a life is to um, help them come closer to the Dhamma. And if you feel that it's not possible because they're not receptive, don't worry. Just by exhibiting qualities mm -hmm. of the Dhamma, that is helping them come in contact. If you're practicing the Dhamma and they're in contact with you, they are closer to the Dhamma. Mm. what do you so, say well sometimes it's difficult because most people aren't really interested in the dhamma yeah they just uh, want to watch tv and mm. go out to dinner and and uh, drink wine and uh, shout out about shout about politics <laughs> but that's not so far removed i mean i think you can do all that and still develop kindness and generosity yeah, um, yeah. benefit yeah. from having a son of or daughter who yeah. practices because even if they can't yet accept it I mean their lives are made better for it they don't know that 
how do you know? I don't believe that. We disagree somehow. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? <laughs> they don't show it. My parents didn't show it for a long time, but now they've had Adrian Brown round to the house and they were talking very animatedly for hours, actually. I've never seen Adrian Brown so engaged in anybody's house, except when we went to his cousin, it was similar. <laughs> <laughs> and they've had Adrian Bramali twice. <laughs> and over time, uh, they came closer, you know? Yeah. But anyway, we should probably respond more to the people here uh, do you want to go okay uh you know, okay and what happens if someone is from a family where their parents have abused them or abandoned them i think this has something very beautiful to say about this what about you me yeah, I know. I mean, talk about it. <laughs> because my parents didn't abuse me, abandoned them. Yeah, yeah. It's a very difficult thing to um, um, deal with. Yes, I I uh, can only empathize, but I think the question is more: Do you still have a duty? You 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 would have a duty. Would you? Yeah, I guess you would do it to the best of your ability from a place where you feel uh, not. Mm. How would you say? Um, from a difficult place. How do you say that? You mean you you could do it so long as it doesn't harm you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a bit hard. Mm. It's a bit hard. Should we so, go to some um, yes. questions from here? Okay. Diana? Hi. Hi, Venerable Chanda. Hi, Hi. Venerable Pekka. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> um, I really appreciate the uh, little explanation you gave at the beginning, Venerable Upeka, about the a ritual of kind of worshiping or giving honor to the six directions. And then the Buddha is giving his, you know, well, here's how you really do it. You know, I know some other stories similar to that where he's like, well, here's how you really do this or do that and what it means. But basically what I'm getting from this so far is that Bhikkhu Bodhi explained what the six different relationships are. Okay. And the first one is parents and children, and they're both a two-way street. So the Buddha here is telling us what um, how how a child should minister to the parent, and then how a parent should minister to a child. Like what's the proper way? And when I saw this list, and I was you were reading the way that the parents should reciprocate I'm like oh well my parents didn't do this they didn't do that they didn't do that one and they didn't do that one <laughs> so um mm -hmm. just to um tell us point in the last question like I don't think it well it it may impact what I owe them or not they've both passed away now anyways mm -hmm. but to me it's more of a issue of um oh my parents did not fulfill their duty period like and it just kind of puts it there in a dispassionate way and you know of course if there's damage done and abuse and things like that you know we have to recover from that and get help for that and so forth but the bottom line is that they didn't do their duty and in a way that kind of exonerates the child like from mm. feeling guilty or feeling um if only I had done something different, it's like, no, that was their duty and they didn't fulfill it. And um, it's kind of lovely in a way to just have that mm. release of uh, mm. responsibility on the child for how, how the parent behaved. Mm -hmm. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. And it's interesting because when you actually look more closely at the words, it does say, having been supported by them, I will support them. Mm -hmm. So there's this sense of gratitude attitude it's coming from a sort of sense of I appreciate what they gave me I'll give what I can to them 
Whereas some of the other things are not necessarily based on that. For example, um, after my parents' deaths, I will distribute gifts on their behalf. This could be done by anybody, regardless of how the parents treated you. But I think there are some things that will be elicited by a sense of gratitude and a mm. sense of um, what's appropriate. Mm. And, I mean, the Buddha never encouraged us to move into harmful situations. He still said we should associate with the wise. So there might be ways of serving from a distance mm. or in a way that is, um, you know, even um, someone said mm. in the chat, Perhaps our duty can be to forgive, you know, mm. not to have ill will towards the person mentally. Mm. So yeah. I just want to come to the chat and um, pick up some other comments. So, um, yeah, Hilaya's um, offering another point from the anger to a three. Three things prescribed by the wise, prescribed by good people. Number one, giving. Number two, the going forth. Mm. So that's the teacher mm. and follower if you like relationship I don't know how they mm. call it here teacher and student and attending upon one's mother and father so again in a way that's appropriate so someone else is saying I didn't get on with yeah but we're not meant to say people's names oh well, well, I, I oh right, right. Yeah, for the recording right. I didn't get on with my parents at all as a child but about the age of eight from a from about the age of eight, but now in my 60s, I find myself with a deep sense of gratitude that at least they gave me life. Yeah, that's wonderful. In that sense, I guess it also shows that we can still serve our parents. I mean, that's why I pointed out the one about gifts after, you know, after their deaths. And one of those gifts can be that we develop those feelings towards them and wish them well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Should we go to the chat? I mean, all right. Um, I'll just go to Shirley because okay. I'll trust it okay. in order. Shirley, have you received your message to unmute? Okay. I, I just wanted to share a bit of experience um, as a social worker. Oh, yeah. And I worked in fostering adopt and adoption for many years, and I came across many children who had been really badly treated by their parents and nearly all of them loved their parents mm -hmm. there was one family I think there was only one that stuck in my mind where they hated their parents and those parents had been really really cruel mm -hmm. and those children were so damaged they just couldn't do any of this yeah and it's a sad situation that sometimes the 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 the, the, the lack of care by the parents is so is so bad <laughs> they just haven't fulfilled their you know right yeah maybe they've given birth to them they've fed them they've not you know but yeah. but the children are so damaged they can't do it but with most of them there's some love there they want to they want to give something they may mm. you know so it's interesting that they that most of them love them but then some of them because they haven't had the care they just can't do it even no, if and I think yeah absolutely and I think the Buddha never said to neglect ourselves right I mean yeah. he was trying to teach non-self from the to help us also understand that if to look at things more objectively right so if you look at a situation where, okay, the parents are harming another and that other person is actually at that moment being harmed, then objectively the first person you need to help is the person being harmed. Okay. I think in that case the, the child's responsibility is towards themselves, not towards the mm -hmm. abuser at all, not at that stage, you know. And, and, yeah, trusting that you still have goodwill towards the parent, maybe not all the time, but trusting that that may come if you do the work of, you know, healing because... Mm -hmm. We can't just neglect our own pain and look out for another person. That's actually a way to get into abuse, isn't it? Yeah. But the good thing, the nice thing about this sort of is that it's reciprocal. It's mm. actually saying, yes, parents do have responsibilities to their mm. children. And sometimes other sorters don't mention that. So, uh, but, you know, just my experience that sometimes kids are so damaged that they you sort of even wonder in this lifetime whether they'll ever heal, and it's very sad. Yeah, that's right. It's not. You there, Manoui? Yeah. Yeah, so 
it's it's a very difficult situation at the you know with uh, people like you know um, what Shirley described, and but if you are at some kind of a place in the Buddhist path, maybe that is a that is um, kind of a uh, way of you practicing your Brahma Viharas. Can you be at least kind in mind to them, or at least upekka, like the neutrality without hating? So. Um, you know, so that is kind of a, it is a path. It, I don't know whether everybody can do it, how, how bad the, you know, the damage is, but that's what I thought. And also I kind of remembered about the micro families living everywhere and, um, you know, parents live somewhere and the children live somewhere and they have, they have work, they have small children. And how do you kind of manage? It's, it's, a lot challenging than um you know people living in one village but um it is something it is a duty i see like not like a transaction okay you did only one person to me so here's your one person but i know that it can't be done you know that is where we need to slowly develop and i don't know even if you develop whether you can do that um that is where I suppose the equanimity comes. Thanks. Yeah, and actually you made me think that it's also a societal thing, right? Because um, sometimes maybe, first of all, we need support in order to support the parent, first of all, to heal if there has been abuse, mm. but also support systems in society. I mean, what has happened is the, you know, all this nursing homes that are, are being built, that which actually replace um the care that you know may once have come from the extended family so maybe there are different systems better systems you know also there's sort of old people's mm. like um apartments and things like that where they can mm. live with people of a similar age or there's like um live in mm. care or you know but again it's not affordable for everybody and everyone has a, a limited means. So, mm. I mean, one of the problems of course is that uh, people are living longer as well mm. and uh you know, it's um, almost unrealistic to be able to be with them through all those years of, say, dementia. It's not safe, actually. At a certain point, it's not safe. And your duty then might be to make um, a very complicated but um, clear-sighted decision, which might not be what you'd wish, but still maybe the best in the circumstance. Yes. Benjamin, nice to see you in the Sutta discussion. Hello. Nice to see you at the Meta. Um, so I uh, had one small thing to add on uh, on a point about children who'd been abused or abandoned, which is I think it's very significant that it does say first one should think having been supported by them I will support okay. them. And mm -hmm. you may have talked a bit about that, but I was thinking also that yeah. could imply that these are not one's duties necessarily to one's birth parents; they're right. one's duties to the people who have supported you growing up. So it could be. Yeah that this could uh, apply to others. Than yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but the main thing I was sort of thinking about is I can't quite get my head around this keep up the family tradition business. Yeah. Mm. Um, maybe because I don't have a family tradition as such that I've noticed, but I can't quite decide what that could mean. Um, and it also seems a bit of an outlier in this list, uh, thinking yeah. about, I completely agree. you know, um, if you think about the, the way the Buddha talks about karma and things. Yeah. One gets born into a family because of sort of force of habit. Those are the kind of people one's been involved with mm -hmm. over gener uh, lifetimes and lifetimes. And keeping up a family tradition seems to me like it could be just reinforcing that habitual karma rather than breaking out of the cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, The Buddha also had to keep, be in keeping what was, you know, in society at that time okay, acceptable yeah. so he couldn't yeah. he no. had to honor that as well I don't think he had to honor it but I don't think it was just acceptable it was actually the way mm. the society worked well that's one thing I was thinking about I was wondering if yeah. there's some specific historical context yeah mm. I think so yeah. yeah I mean in those days society was organized into kind of different um I mean different castes but not necessarily discriminative where people, I mean, among those castes, there'd be tiny, tiny subcasts as well. And you'd be born into a chain of, say, carpenters or merchants or brahmins. And 
And it kind of worked in a way to organise everybody. So it was quite uncommon, I think, that you would leave that tradition. It was seen as kind of, maybe it was seen as comic, although I don't know that the Buddha said that it was. But I think it was more a social organisation um, that yeah. just seemed to work. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, we don't live in those days, so we don't really know how well it worked or, you know, whether that was kind of universal. Mm. Um, but to me, I guess I interpret it as being something around um, maybe performing livelihood that's in keeping with the values of the family, something like this um something that doesn't sort of um cloud their reputation or their name in some way you know like even today we say oh anyone can do what they they want you can go for whatever your chosen profession but it's difficult isn't it if you've got parents who've been say I don't know expecting you to follow the same sort of career that they do and you choose mm -hmm. to be a nun or you choose mm -hmm. to um I don't know do something like I have a friend who was trained as a doctor and then he decided actually that's not fulfilling so now he's running a garden center instead which happens and to be his family business it does actually happen to be his family business that's true but um but you know they may have felt disappointed by that so I think in a way it means kind of be making mm. keeping your family honorable as well I mean it could be seen that way mm. but my in, intuition is that it's mainly around the way ancient India mm. society was organized mm. yeah I think yeah does that okay. make sense yeah um should we read some of these yeah, yeah. okay so no. Yeah, okay. Both my parents abused me, but I still felt that I had a duty towards them because they fed and clothed me. So, um, okay. Um, sorry, someone else. <laughs> Until you forgive, you won't let go and will therefore be harming yourself. Easier said than done. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Actually, the older I go, grow, I realize that uh, my parents did only what they, at age 25 or whatever they were, when my, mm. they knew what only 25 year olds know when they had me. So, um, uh, how, how would they have known any different? Mm. It allows me to uh, kind of see their conditioning and, you know, that's what young men and women at that time did. Um, but it's true, not being able to forgive is actually painful for yourself. Like the Buddha says, it's like when you're angry with someone, before you throw a hot coal, you hold, you grasp onto the hot coal, you burn yourself first before you throw it. So the person who hurts the most when you are unable to forgive is yourself. It's strange that we we we, we kind of enjoy not forgiving. We enjoy sort of holding on to our grudges somehow strangely satisfying to be right and to be you know I know and they didn't mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know why we do this yes I also just want to add to that comment though that it's not an absolute that there's a point where forgiveness it's either black or white you either aren't forgiving or you suddenly forgive you either can't let go or you let go all of it is a process so we're actually not necessarily harming ourselves if we have the intention to forgive. You know, it starts with an intention. It's a process. So we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. Oh, I can't forgive. This is terrible. I'm hurting myself. Not really. I mean, understand that it's natural to have resentment. It's natural to hurt. It's natural that everybody, I mean, not only wants, but children need a safe and loving, nurturing environment to grow up in. So it's quite natural that there'll be that, you know, difficulty, mm. um, a lot to uh, to heal from, 
basically. And a lot of self-compassion is needed. So rather than tell myself, I find for myself, if I tell myself, oh dear, I can't forgive this is bad for me. Oh, that makes it much, much worse. You know, it's much better if I just trust that I don't, I know that anger is harmful. I know that I'm hurt, but over time I'll forgive and I'll just trust that that will happen. I keep on doing my practice. I keep on developing metta and bit by bit, I see the feelings change. They soften, Mm. they start to fail. Aid. and when I think of an incident or a person I don't get quite so triggered I don't get quite mm. so um, harmed and bit by bit other sort of reflections come in like I also had that reflection mm. where I suddenly realized gosh I'm 48 now my parents were like really quite young when mm. they had me I mean how are you supposed to know what to do in your 20s I mean they're 27 28 but it's not like you have a practice run I mean maybe in a past life but it's a different situation isn't it so, I mean, it's not like people go to parenting school and you're bringing all your own traumas with you if you haven't had the chance and the support to work through those. So it's very, very hard to prepare. One of the reasons I chose not to do it, to be honest. So nowadays I kind of respect people who give it a try. <laughs> but really be very kind with yourself with this idea, the mm. ideals of, you know, you have to forgive, you have to do your duty, you have to be good. I mean... Um, a lot of that is also a sense of self. We have to work with what's there, work with the emotions that are there. And um, okay. and it's very multifaceted, isn't it? What we were talking about this afternoon about mm-hmm. acceptance. Mm, exactly. Yeah. What was that phrase you used? Well, it's it's a, called acceptance commitment therapy, ACT, which is a new form of psychology, which is quite popular nowadays. But uh, the point is that before you, you <clears throat> can trans, you can do anything, you have to first accept where you are. Yeah, you can't yeah. move on without accepting yeah. where you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 that's right we've missed lots of comments here yeah is that I mean, because this one's really long if you don't mind that. i'm gonna skip the ones which quote the suttas for now because i want to really respond to individuals and there's mm. quite a few here maybe we can just read them because i didn't see them mm. till now and then we'll come to liz um family tradition might be to give dana to particular, particular sectors could be mm-hmm. could be I suppose mm. it means pick up whatever's good and virtuous in the family. I mean, you mm. have to see all these teachings yeah, yeah. as part of a contextual whole. It always, everything we do has to align with the Eightfold Path as far as we can, right? We align it mm. with the Eightfold Path. Mm. So, of course, the Buddha's never saying that family tradition should supplant basic ethics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's that's true. also possible. True. Yeah, it's true. In Sri Lanka, family tradition means that when someone has passed away, you... Mm. Um, Go to the monastery, whether mm. you knew it was good or not, and you offer mm. dana to the yeah. monastics. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that sounds interesting. Okay. Thing. Keeping up the family tradition means getting married, <laughs> having a son to con- continue the family line. That's a good point. Yeah. It might be it might be that sort <laughs> of uh, straightforward. And of course, sons in those days were considered like even now is considered the you know ideal to have something they seem to forget that if everyone has a son there'll be no human beings so it's kind of faulty thinking you could say um but yeah that of course the buddha said a woman can be okay. just as good if not better than a man if she's virtuous if not better than a man even a man can you imagine even a woman can be better than a man wow amazing yeah but it doesn't mean it that way (laughs) it's just to say that you can't make any such valuations based on gender or any other superficial difference between us all okay so i feel there are traditions in my family although they are hard to explain specifically we seem to have some habits jobs we have done generation Mm. by generation and some attitudes Mm. yeah that's a good point things that we might not notice as traditions just like sometimes people think oh you know this um factor of stream winning not being attached to rights and rituals everyone's not attached to rights and rituals but when you look at the way you live Mm. 
and the sort of things you allow yourself mm. or don't allow yourself to do mm. we are quite ingrained in our habits mm. and our, oh if I do this everything will be okay if I don't mm. do that I didn't do my job today or you know mm. <laughs> as a monastic I shouldn't sort of explain that I need a certain type of food and yeah we we do get um we do have those and and yeah. I'm not saying they're always negative yeah. either but um yeah yeah some habits yeah. and jobs we've done generation by generation yeah. because we're conditioned right? yes you don't That's think interesting. of them. yeah how you lay the table how you right greet guests how you so many things yeah just... I mean sometimes yeah. I think I sound just like my mom or what. like yeah I sound just like my mom yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> but, but yeah if we do pick up the good stuff there's a lot of good mm. stuff to pick up you or at least it depends right it depends on the family of course but um simple mm. things for example mm. being hospitable or mm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. let's um okay uh oh i'm not sure why just that last okay time. yeah so i'm not sense. sure why we should be grateful for being born <laughs> yeah well yeah you want to say anything to that that's a good sense of humor <laughs> it might be serious well, here we are <laughs> okay so the next comment oh, I, mean, I wanted to go to Liz okay right. actually, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Sure, 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 sure. yeah but can I say something about that just <laughs> briefly because I used to feel a bit like that too like I actually wasn't very happy to be born really not especially in my teens it's like <laughs> no I don't want this I don't want this ever again this is it <laughs> this is not good there is well not just not good but there's no point is what I felt and there's a lot of suffering mm-hmm. and it's a big mess but I had an instinct that there must be a reason I'm here. I mean, it's not that I saw deeply into karma, but once I found the Dhamma, I realized that was the point. And it's being able to practice the Dhamma that makes the human life so precious. You know, if we are in contact with the Dhamma and we do get to develop a little bit of kindness or a little bit more patience than maybe we came into this world with, or we're able to, you know, cheer up a friend or we're able to do some kind of livelihood that serves in any way, you know, even just, I don't know, mm-hmm. taking someone in the taxi, you're a taxi driver, and you're taking people from A to B, you're being friendly to them, you're a safe space for them, you know. Mm-hmm. All of these things serve others. So it's not only about ourselves, it's like our lives can be of great benefit to others, mm-hmm. even in very humble ways. And um as a human being, we have a chance to reflect mm. on exactly that kind of question and to um, to share our understanding with others. So even if life is very difficult, you can share whatever tools and tricks you learn or even just the sense of understanding of how difficult life can be with others. And that brings more compassion into the world. So mm. I think it's what we do with our lives that makes them mm. worthwhile or not. It's not so much that being born or being human or being whatever breathing is inherently good or bad but we can make it that way mm. you know Ajahn Brahm has this nice um simile of life being like a kind of pe- uh, a drawing made in black and black pen on white paper and it has no color it's just an empty you know like a coloring book it's just a kind of mm. shape and you take the color and you color it in Okay, some people might not have as many colours as other people that still might colour it really carefully, really beautifully with sensitivity. Mm-hmm. You know, other people have lots of lovely colours, but they just scribble all over it. And But you have the chance to put something into this world. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, we're glad you're born because you're here today. And <laughs> and that's lovely because you're one of this community. So. Yeah. <laughs> but you shouldn't be anything I mean I always think the word should is kind of not in line with the Dhamma I don't think we have to put the word should on us at all but yeah maybe just explore to see if there are things you're grateful for Mm. we go to Liz now and then come back to Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I wanted to go back to what you were saying about forgiving is a process uh, because in fact, it's a process which can yield 
a richness that you couldn't find any other way or I couldn't find any other way. Uh, because, well, as soon as I could, I left home, obviously, you know, having been abused all my childhood. I got myself a backpack and I went to New Zealand. I couldn't go much further because then I would be coming back. Uh, and um, I uh, worked a lot. I, wa I wasn't a Buddhist at the time, but I worked a lot at looking what damage that had done in me. And uh, I I'm nearly 70 now. Uh, I have forgiven a long time ago. But in fact, it has been a richness because I've had to do this work or yeah. I wouldn't be alive today. And, um, and I have forgiven my parents um, a long time ago. And every night I share my merits with them. And um, I, I have grown a lot from that. I think, yes, I mean, I, I was abused in many, many ways and for many, many years. But it has made what I am uh, now yeah. because I've chosen how to respond to the abuse. And uh, that is something we can do. Yeah. Uh, say not being grateful for being born well yeah obviously but on the other hand if you are born you make the most of what there is around you and I, I, that has helped me I became a foster mom I uh uh, I've done lots of work. I was a nurse and then I became a psychology teacher. I studied psychology because I wanted to understand. Mm -hmm. So in fact, having, having been abused has been a motor, an engine in my life. And um, I'm not saying that I don't wish, you know, that it might have been different, you know, I had a few less uh, broken bones, but I've learned a lot. So it is turning negativity in something actually very positive. And the, the compassion for people um, is something which, when you've done this work, becomes automatic because you know, you know how it feels to suffer a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, it, you know, being resentful, it takes time, but being resentful is not the way or you become bitter. Mm. Mm. Thank you. That's a really moving story. And um, you just made me realise that um, a part of that whole process is not only becoming you know, more compassionate and, and becoming wiser and doing beautiful things, but actually realizing that you're doing that. Because mm -hmm. sometimes we might not recognize that actually we have a lot of beautiful qualities as a result mm -hmm. of some of these things, you know. We might just think, oh, this is terrible and I'm no good and I'm hopeless. But we can see that we're actually giving quite a bit of good into the world. So I think it's also wonderful to hear that you know that you're able to serve others, you know, and that's part of the Buddha's teachings too, that we should reflect on um, the wonderful things we actually have to share and the goodness of our lives. So I'm glad that you are able to do both, not only serve, but know the joy that that can bring you when you reflect on it. Well, actually, yeah, I, I lived near Amavaraki because I came back from New Zealand. I lived in the UK. I lived in Luton. And I didn't know Amavarati existed. And in Ashwish Park, I saw a monk and I thought, what is that guy doing here? And that's mm -hmm. how I discovered the, the Dhamma because I was quite intrigued. But once I discovered the, the Dhamma, I, I saw Mm. Oh, sorry. I, I thought that is made for me, and th that in a way prepared, that was the way which prepared me to listen to the Dhamma. Yeah. So it has very positive outcome. That's wonderful. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> yes, like the suffering can prepare us to hear the Dhamma, mm. which is actually one of the first causes in the chain mm. from suffering to confidence to practicing the Dhamma and the joy that comes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you for playing. We'll come to um now because she also has a.
Sorry, I did mention your name <laughs> as well. I try not to. Okay. So you want to read it? Yeah. My mother was abusive and wasn't a good parent. I didn't have a good relationship with her for most of my life and had to spend time not in contact with her. My mom grew up in an orphanage and did not learn parenting skills. Now she is 88 and having health issues and I'm taking care of her. There's not a lot of support in the US for all the people unless you are wealthy. There's no one else to help my mom but me. We have a better relationship now because of my practice. I do my best not to engage in arguments or harsh speech with her. When my mom acts in these ways, I try to take a break from her. Caring for her is not sustainable long term because I'm chronically ill and disabled myself, but I'm doing my best to help her as long as I can. Even though she wasn't a good parent, I feel that doesn't release me from taking care of her. And I sometimes feel like caring, caring for her lovingly heals the child I was that wasn't cared for lovingly. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Caring, yeah. For, her caring for her lovingly heals the child that wasn't cared, cared for. for lovingly. Yes. Oh. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's almost like becoming her mom, you know. Yeah. Although you're not her mom, but giving her that mm. love she didn't receive. It's beautiful. Mm. And also remembering to give ourselves that love that we maybe didn't receive. Mm. Actually, sometimes that's also a hard ask. If you haven't received it, to then give it to yourself. Actually, what you need mm. is to find someone else who can give it. Hmm. Mm. And I also feel I learned so much from having a difficult childhood. I'm so much more compassionate mm -hmm. because of the things I've been through. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 The trick mm -hmm. is to remember that when we're going through difficult things, I find. Mm -hmm. It can be really helpful. It's one of my kind of go-to reflections mm -hmm. if I'm going through a hard time, that this is going to bring about more compassion mm -hmm. if I can just stay with it. You know, try not to reject it. Try to um, mm. find a beautiful way to be with it. You know, to be tender with it, mm. to be gentle, to be um, accepting. Mm. You know, and just trust that that keeping that connection, even in times of suffering, with myself enables me to be more connected with others mm. when they suffer too. Because you know it, you've been there. Mm. You know, you felt that difficulty, and we all feel it. But it's so important to keep our heart open as much as we can mm. because the alternative is just to shut down mm. yeah. and cut ourselves mm. off from other people, right? When we shut mm. down, we kind of become too scared yeah. to receive any support. Yeah. 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 Wow, we got through like exactly, um, yes, well, two really progress, rich. but only the parent part yeah. because that's really quite a, you know, complex and probably could be quite triggering but certainly very provocative of thought mm. and reflection mm. there's another comment no oh. so i think a parent can love their child and do their best but still be an awful parent mm. we should remember this when we think about our parents yeah, yeah. i remember yeah. yeah, sorry, I've mentioned your name, but I guess it's not too personal. But <laughs> I can remember you making that point at um, a meta class, and it struck me actually. It struck mm. me because sometimes we're too harsh, judges, yeah. we? we're too quick to judge, right. we don't know what right. they were going through, what they were struggling right. with. We think that because we didn't get our needs met, that means yeah. that they didn't try, but they might have shown their love in ways that we just, you know, yeah. we didn't understand, we didn't mm. recognize, you know. Different people mm. show love differently. Mm -hmm. Some people show it by trying to mm. fix things or mm. problem solve. Some people show it by listening. Some people mm. show it by providing. Mm. You know, some people show it just by showing up, maybe, <laughs> even if they're not emotionally available. Mm. You know, or some people are sort of emotionally mm. emotional, let's say, but it's not the emotion you want them to have. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like, they worry whereas you want reassurance you know or um 
you want to hear that they're proud of you but they just say oh you know keep working <laughs> sometimes the needs don't quite match but I uh I guess all parents love to a degree it's hard to imagine they don't but mm. on the other hand how do we define love you know and I think that's the tricky bit because there's certainly a lot of attachment certainly mm. a lot of attachment but perhaps the sense of ownership or position mm. or identification with this being as my child or say can work the other way my parent can mm. you know really distort the capacity to love I think mm. I'm reading a wonderful book I don't know if I mentioned it already by bell hooks called all about love if you haven't read it just buy it it's mm. one of those classic like visionary books and um it's wonderful you know I mean I always always felt that myself that love is a verb you know love is something you do love is something you cultivate Mm. it's a way of behaving towards another it's not something you just feel because we can feel all kinds of emotions Mm. towards another person but a lot of that is a kind of sentimentality or an attachment Mm. or even and that is very close to hate actually because if we cling we're clinging to something that we're afraid of losing or changing or you know we're clinging out of need and if that need isn't met again you know if that person changes then it can lead to hate so yeah I think there's love there but you know again the quality of love that we can offer to our parents or ourselves or a child is dependent to a great extent on how much purification of our minds we've done Mm. you know Metta as an antidote, as the opposite of ill will, is actually a practice of overcoming that ill will, that fear. And these are the roots of suffering in our hearts, right? These are the really deep roots that we all have. So I guess in that sense, you could say pure metta can only really come at the mm-hmm. very high stage of enlightenment, you know? But we're trying and it's a mm-hmm. practice. So it's not like it's either there or it's not. And I think, you know, if you can't love say a parent or someone you think you should you can still practice love to people that it comes easily towards you start with the easy person and then you progress Mm. you widen out Mm. Mm -hmm. I don't know know, most of us just do the best we know how yeah all of us right I mean what is the best the irony is I know I know and some people can be awful and some people go to war but they go because they think it's the right thing to do this is the tragedy of delusion isn't it it's a big tragedy like distortion of view where you think something incredibly unwholesome is wholesome Mm. but I don't think people usually think what they're doing is wrong wrong no (laughs) they don't they're doing it because they think it's right yes but so, you you're really only doing the very best you can based on your conditioning and that's mm. why the, the, you know one of the factors for stream winning is mm. hearing the words of another it means hearing the words of someone who is enlightened in other words the mm. buddha or anyone you may have that respect towards anyone mm. is at least really sincere on the path right and you have to have a different program put in there otherwise we will follow mm. all these traditions including our family tradition etc etc so we have to have that discernment every step of the way. And the, um, yeah, the uh, opportunity to hear the Dhamma. I often mm. think that's the difference, you know, between people who are, you know, just engaged in conflict. I mean, I'm thinking of wars across mm. the world, you know, not only in the Middle East. War is war, right? Mm. I mean, in Burma, yeah. Burmese people killing Burmese people, you know, the army killing the subjects, subjects, citizens, um, and then all the other different ethnic groups. And I mean, it's all due to delusion and not really hearing the teachings. I mean, actually, in that country, you could say it's Buddhist, but there's a difference between hearing and understanding, you know. Mm. So if we can, that helps me have compassion. Mm-hmm. and also recognize I might not be so different if I didn't mm-hmm. hear the teachings you know how do I know mm-hmm. I've got to keep hearing them keep brainwashing mm-hmm. keep conditioning keep you know moving down the right track yeah and coming to groups like this and staying connected to one another you know so you can check out if you're thinking correctly in line with the Dhamma or if it's gone you know a little bit awry so I think that's all from us. 
We went. Do I have to cue the person in the room? I don't like to have to cue. <laughs> yeah, we did one paragraph. That's right. <laughs> well, we can do the next paragraph next week. <laughs> and tomorrow we do some letter practice as well at seven, uh, not seven, at nine o'clock. Um, Manori? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't hear you. Oh. Yeah. You can just jump in. Yeah. So, um, if, you know, since some of you are new, I would just uh, remind that all these, all these talks are given freely on donation basis and in the spirit of generosity. And... Um, all these teachings you can you can find in the YouTube and there's loads of the teachings um, there, uh, years and years worth of teaching. And uh, so uh, the with you with with your generosity, Anukampa Bikuni project um, is can provide all these Dhamma talks and the teachings and also um, uh, create a place in the UK um, for any any woman, you know, from anywhere, not only UK, to um, come mean, and um, practice, um, yeah, in the in the due course, come and practice and be a nun if you want. And um, so that opportunity is only available in the UK uh, by Anukampa Bikuni project. So, um, um, so uh, that is what you can be part of this community. And uh, so uh, the, these days, the main needs are uh, providing uh, providing food, because as as you know that Virbal Chanda told that you know it is you know in the in the in the coming weeks um, uh, the Vihari is moving into a bigger board, but that comes with some challenges where it is not close to the supermarkets, and. Uh, so there is a method of um, getting the food and uh, there is a WhatsApp group called Anukampa Food at the Ready. And if you want to, you know, get into that group, um, you can email team at Anukampa Project. I'm just copying the link and putting it here. Um, yeah, and also there is a list of uh, needed items. Uh, in the website and uh, if you live far away you can have a look at the needed items and contribute for that as well you can organize uh, food dana uh, remotely as well if you live you know drivable distance you can drive there uh, there is a booking system that you can book the danas and the final thing is, I, you know, since we are going to this bigger board, there will be different costs, um, uh, much different to um, uh, the terraced uh, semi-detached house that we have in, in, the, in Oxford now. So it, it will be very grateful if you can make Dana through standing orders, money, as it, is, as it will help uh, maintaining the day-to-day -day monastic costs, Bihara, overheads, monthly bills, and uh, things like that. And I will put another link as well, how to donate. And um, if you are able, you can press the, press the link uh, and donate. And there are lots of other ways. Um, keep checking the website and there'll be new, uh, you know, opportunities coming. And uh, uh, the, there's a bigger place and it has to be maintained. So um, keep checking that. And um, and uh, we hope you'll get uh, involved in the community to make this sustainable and grow. Thank you. Thank you, Manori. And just to say that there's also a very special um, event happening next Saturday. So this Saturday is the Meta Practice. Next Saturday, instead of the meta practice, which won't happen next Saturday, um, there is a second special monastery meeting. I'm so sorry for the people in America here because it really isn't a good time for you, but um, <laughs> I know. But it's from nine GMTV. Uh, GMTV. What's GMTV? Is the thing? No. <laughs> GMT. <laughs> <laughs> nine o'clock i'm very tired till uh 10 30 a.m 
not yeah gm whatever tp <laughs> and uh and we had one about three weeks ago and it was a kind of celebration for the prospect of this new monastery and it also turned into something of a kind of mobilizing meeting for volunteers that may want to be involved and people shared ideas for the kind of support structures and systems and jobs and community based activities we might be able to put in place and it was incredibly uplifting and inspiring there was a little mini auction as well which was just mind-blowing really very very touching I don't think we are going to do that again this time because we don't want to exploit your generosity even though it's very much fun and we do have some more paintings but I think that's for another time but uh this time it's slightly shorter and we'll start with a guided meditation from Ajahn Brown again and then hi Timmy it's Timmy Hendrix it is. <laughs> hey, I love him. I've met him twice. Anyway, that's just the dog, uh, Timmy Hendrix. <laughs> He's really beautiful. I love him. He meditates. <laughs> Diana and me meditated. Hi, darling. Oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, keep on track. So, um, yeah, this time we'll do the meditation with Ajahn Brown. Then we'll have a little bit of an update on what's happened. So. This time we meet, we'll actually have, the property will be legally ours. So that's a big difference. And uh, and we'll look into kind of um, gathering some contact details, anyone local who might be able to offer support and anyone international as well, different ways mm -hmm. and different, um, uh, different uh, structures and systems we can put in place. So I hope you can come. It's a registration only. So you can go to our events page. I wrote it there and um also on our website that is our website newsletter newsletter as well anyway before i completely say something stupid <laughs> and also the battery is uh running low on the computer as well as in my body um i think we'd better say goodbye and uh maybe see you tomorrow hmm. yeah hmm. and we'll both be there or maybe you'll do it even hmm? you'd like to do the meta would you like Venable Packer to do a garden metal tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> I I would like it because oh, I get to meditate. Yes. That'd be nice. Yes. Anyway, she's very good at garden metal. <laughs> so we'll see you soon. <laughs>